This is a video for the fourth and final unit in Paper 1 of AQA GCSE Biology or Combined Science. Since 40% of the marks in the GCSE Science exams are for recalling facts from the specification, I've written a series of questions which you can find at the link in the description below so that you can check how well you've memorised these key facts. Let's get started. The word equation for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water reacts to form glucose plus oxygen. It doesn't matter which way round you place your two reactants and which way round you place your two products, but it definitely does matter what goes on the left side of the equation and what goes on the right. It's also really important that you have an arrow in the centre of the equation, definitely not an equal sign. And if the question asks for a word equation, you won't get marks for giving the symbols. Also, in the biology exams, we write light on top of the arrow. The balanced symbol equation for photosynthesis is 6 moles of carbon dioxide reacting with 6 moles of water to make 1 mole of glucose and 6 moles of oxygen. An endothermic reaction is one that takes in energy from its surroundings. And in order for photosynthesis to take place, there must be a transfer of energy as light. The chloroplasts are responsible for absorbing light, and within those chloroplasts it's the green chlorophyll that actually absorbs the light. Your graph for question 7 should look like this, and the reason for this is that in the early part of the graph towards the bottom left of it, light is the limiting factor, and therefore as you increase light, you increase the rate of photosynthesis. However, as you give more and more light, eventually light stops being the limiting factor, and either carbon dioxide or temperature will be limiting instead. And so the graph plateaus, because it doesn't matter how much more light you give, there's already enough light. The graph for carbon dioxide concentration looks pretty much identical, and again this is for the same reason. So in the initial part of the graph, as you increase carbon dioxide concentration, the rate of photosynthesis increases because carbon dioxide is limiting at that point. And so if you give the plant more carbon dioxide, it can do more photosynthesis. But eventually you reach a point where the carbon dioxide is in excess, and it doesn't matter how much more carbon dioxide you give, you won't speed up um, the rate of photosynthesis, because either the temperature or the light intensity is now limiting, and so the graph plateaus. The graph for temperature looks a little bit different to the previous two. In the first part of the graph, we see that as temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. And this is expected, because photosynthesis is a chemical reaction, even though it's happening in a living organism. As you know from your Unit 6 chemistry, as you heat up chemical reactions, the particles move more quickly and they have more energy. So they collide more frequently and they're more likely to have the activation energy when they do collide, which allows them to react. So in the first part of the graph, we see that increasing temperature will increase the rate. However, photosynthesis is catalyzed by enzymes. And those enzymes, if they're heated up too much, will denature, which means that their active site is permanently changed shape. And therefore, it can't interact with the substrate anymore. So after that point, those enzymes are useless and the rate of photosynthesis will rapidly trail off. A limiting factor is the thing that is slowing down a chemical reaction. In this instance, photosynthesis. So it could be that there's insufficient light. It could be that it's too cold. It could be that there's not enough carbon dioxide. Or it could be that the leaves don't have sufficient chlorophyll. But whatever it is, it's the one factor that is slowing down photosynthesis. On the graph that's pictured to the right hand side, at point X, carbon dioxide is limiting. And you can tell because increasing carbon dioxide does increase the rate of reaction. So that must have been the thing holding the whole process back. At point Y, increasing carbon dioxide concentration doesn't have any impact. So that's not the limiting factor anymore. And instead, it will be either light or temperature. The photosynthesis required practical comes up regularly as a six mark question in which you're asked to write a method. This is quite straightforward, but it's easy to lose out on a lot of marks because you forgot something really simple. The classic one is forgetting to mention that you would time the experiment, because if you don't have a time, you can't work out a rate. Firstly, you need to take your aquatic plant and place it in a beaker of water. This will allow you to see the bubbles that are being produced during photosynthesis. Now, we want to think about our control variables before we start. So you add some sodium bicarbonate to the water. This means that there's going to be lots and lots of carbon dioxide available, so we can be certain that this won't be a limiting factor. Likewise, we need to control the temperature to make sure that that's not a limiting factor. 
So one thing you could do is to place your beaker of water inside a water bath to make sure that the temperature is controlled and kept at a steady temperature. But then that's quite challenging to do because you need to be able to shine the light through. So the easier way would be to use a heat screen to protect the water from the temperature change. You're then going to need to use a ruler to place your lamp a set distance away from the beaker, say 20 centimetres to start with. Now you switch on the lamp, but you're not going to start taking readings right away because it's going to take a little while for the lamp to acclimatise to the amount of light that you're giving it. So you maybe want to leave it for a minute or for five minutes until it's kind of figured out what's going on. Then you're going to time for one minute and count the number of bubbles that are released in that time. Or if you're lucky enough to have a gas syringe, you could collect the gas that's being released instead. Now we're going to change our independent variable. So we're trying to control the amount of light that's being given to the plant, but that's quite challenging to control. So what we do instead is we use our ruler to measure out different distances. So we maybe move the lamp to 30 centimetres or 40 centimetres or 50 centimetres. At each distance, we leave it for the same amount of time to acclimatise and then we repeat counting bubbles for the same amount of time. So if we counted it for a minute in the first instance, then we need to count it for a minute in the second instance. Once we've done all of the different distances, it's important that we repeat the entire experiment to ensure that the data are repeatable. The two really important control variables for this experiment are the amount of carbon dioxide and the temperature, because either one of those could be a limiting factor if it's wrong, and we only want the light to be affecting the rate of photosynthesis. So in order to control for the carbon dioxide concentration, we can add a chemical like sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate that will release carbon dioxide into the water and ensure that it's saturated. And there's so much carbon dioxide, it can't possibly be limiting. There are a number of different ways that we could control the temperature of the water. So we could put the whole experiment in a water bath, but as we said, that's a little bit challenging to manage because then you're trying to shine your light and water baths tend to have opaque sides. So what might be easier is to use a heat screen. One of the other options is to make sure that you're not having a change in temperature because the light bulb isn't getting hot and you can achieve that by using an LED bulb. You might also want to talk about things like how for every different distance you would still be using the same lamp. It's easier to carry out this investigation using an aquatic plant because when the plant is underwater you can see the gas that's being produced so you can count the bubbles whereas it's much harder to collect the oxygen that's released during photosynthesis if it's just being released into the atmosphere. If you're sitting the higher tier exams, then you need to be familiar with inverse square law. Now, inverse square law can apply to lots of different things, including the gravitational pull between two objects. But here we're talking about how much light does, say, one centimetre squared of a plant receive. And it's going to depend on the distance between the light source and the plant. The further and further away you move the light source, the more and more its light spreads out, and therefore the less and less light one centimetre squared gets. And this can be described by inverse square law. Say you have a plant that is 10 centimetres away from a light source, and then you move it back so it's 20 centimetres away. That's twice the distance. Well, the amount of light that each centimetre squared of that plant receives will be one quarter, one over two squared. If you moved it back to be 30 centimetres away from the light source, then each centimetre squared of the plant would receive one over three squared of the original light, one ninth. And if you moved it to be 40 centimetres away, then it would receive one sixteenth. And if you moved it to be 50 centimetres away, then it would receive one twenty-fifth. This is inverse square law. Farmers can control greenhouse conditions by keeping lights on overnight so that light is not a limiting factor, maintaining a constant optimum temperature, so that temperature isn't a limiting factor, and by pumping in carbon dioxide. They can literally use a dry ice machine that you would use in the theatre to produce smoke. Much of the glucose made during photosynthesis is used directly for respiration to provide the plant with energy, but it can also be stored in a number of forms. The glucose can be joined together to make a large insoluble polymer called starch. It can also be used to make fats and oils. If it's joined together in a different way, it can be used to make cellulose, which is part of the cell wall and provides strength and support for the cell. Or the glucose can be combined with nitrate ions absorbed from the roots 
in order to make amino acids, which are then used for protein synthesis. Apart from the glucose, the plant needs nitrate ions to make proteins. Now I appreciate that question 22 is a weird one because how do you even define respiration? But your specification says that you should know that cellular respiration is an exothermic reaction which is continuously occurring in living cells. Exothermic reactions are those that transfer energy to their surroundings. Aerobically means using oxygen, whereas anaerobically is without oxygen. The word equation for aerobic respiration is the reverse of the word equation for photosynthesis, namely glucose plus oxygen reacts to form carbon dioxide plus water. And likewise, the simple equation, glucose molecule is C6H12O6 plus 6O2 reacts to form 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Now you have different anaerobic respiration equations depending on whether you're talking about muscle cells or plants and yeast. For muscle cells, it's just glucose reacts to form lactic acid. Now, strictly speaking, the definition for oxygen debt is a higher tier only question. But even if you're sitting foundation, you need to know that the incomplete oxidation of glucose causes a buildup of lactic acid and creates an oxygen debt. So I think it's worth you knowing what an oxygen debt is. Oxygen debt is the amount of extra oxygen that the body needs after it finishes exercising to react with all that lactic acid that's been made because of anaerobic respiration and remove it from the cells. If the muscles have to respire anaerobically during exercise, then they can become fatigued and stop contracting efficiently. In order to get rid of that lactic acid, blood flowing through the muscles transports it to the liver where it's converted back into glucose. The word equation for anaerobic respiration in plant and yeast cells is glucose reacts to form ethanol and carbon dioxide. We call anaerobic respiration in yeast fermentation, and in order for it to occur, it needs to be warm, wet and anaerobic. If you need to name a temperature, we tend to culture yeast at a slightly lower temperature than bacteria, usually something like 30 degrees. Fermentation in yeast is really important for making bread and also making beer, or just alcoholic drinks in general. Aerobic respiration transfers far, far more energy, about 19 times more energy. And this is because aerobic respiration involves the complete oxidation of glucose, whereas anaerobic respiration involves hardly any oxidation at all. Now, questions about exercise are one of the number one places in biology exams where people think that they've nailed it and then don't get any marks because they haven't actually used biology in their answer. They've just answered in terms of common sense. So firstly, the three ways that your body responds to exercise are by increasing your breathing rate, increasing your breathing volume, and increasing your heart rate. The reason that your body responds in these ways is all linked back to aerobic respiration. We've just said that aerobic respiration releases 19 times more energy, so your body is very keen to keep on doing it for as long as possible. But it can't do it unless it has a plentiful supply of glucose and oxygen. So by increasing the breathing rate and the breathing volume, you're increasing the amount of oxygen in your blood. And by increasing the heart rate, you're increasing the transfer of that oxygen around the body. So that gets it to the muscle cells nice and quickly so that they can carry on aerobically respiring. And the reason they want to aerobically respire is to release the energy that you need while exercising. So it's really important in your answer to this question that you talk about the transport of oxygen, that you talk about aerobic respiration, and that you say that the point of aerobic respiration is to release energy. Metabolism can be defined as the sum of all of the chemical reactions in a cell or in the body. The energy for metabolism comes from respiration. The monomer glucose can be polymerized to make starch, which is a storage polymer that's found in seeds and in tubers and even just in starch granules within cells. It can also be used to make cellulose for cell walls and in animals, it can be stored as glycogen rather than a starch. Lipids are made of three fatty acid chains and also a molecule called glycerol. Amino acids are formed from glucose together with nitrate ions. These amino acids can be joined together by peptide bonds to make polypeptides, which are then folded up to make proteins. Prior to excretion, proteins are broken down to make urea. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this useful in your preparation for the GCSE biology exams. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like and subscribe below for more GCSE biology videos coming soon.